Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot and I'm the program coordinator for the MAVEN project. I welcome you today's session on geriatric dermatology, the last in a six part educational series presented by the Vaseline Healing Project and MAVEN project in partnership with Direct Relief. It is my pleasure today to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Daniel Butler, who is a graduate of the University of Arizona College of Medicine and completed his internship at UMC Banner before going on to do his residency in dermatology at the Harvard Medical School Combined Residency Program. He was brought on as faculty at UCSF to spearhead research and clinical programs in aging skin. At UCSF, they now have the country's only geriatric dermatology clinic, as well as an aging skin research collaborative that includes clinicians, epidemiologists, immunologists, and other basic scientists. Nationally, Dr. Butler is a co-founder and the chair of Geriatric Dermatology Society. It has also been a pleasure for Maven Project to partner with Direct Relief and the Vaseline Healing Project. And here's just a little bit more about each of our organizations. Maven Project is a telehealth nonprofit that supports the primary care providers working at safety net clinics across the country. Our experienced volunteer physicians offer provider to provider medical consults, one-on-one -on -one mentoring and customized education sessions. Direct Relief is a nonprofit humanitarian medical assistance organization founded in 1948. Direct Relief supports the needs of healthcare providers and the patients worldwide. And Vaseline continues providing access to care with Direct Relief who has been an ongoing partner for over six years through the Vaseline Healing Project. This partnership helps to support a network of nonprofit health centers and clinics that provide affordable and comprehensive services to those who need it most. So please mark your calendar for our, following, our next presentation, which will be Wednesday, December 14th at 10 a.m. Pacific. It's our Emergency Management and Preparedness and Trauma-Informed Care Response Series. Session number two, de-escalation, response to violence in the workplace and man-made disasters. Okay, Dr. Butler, um, if you'd like to share your screen on, and we can begin. Well, Kristen, thank you so much for that uh, uh, introduction. And I am just absolutely tickled to be speaking with you all today and really getting uh, to partner and teach within these wonderful organizations and within these wonderful threads that the organizations put out there of, uh, of addressing the needs of underserved populations. Um, it's, it's because of organizations like this that you know, these patients are getting their, their time in the sun. And I'm, I'm so excited to be able to, to, to share a, a little piece of that uh, with this thread of uh, geriatric dermatology. And I titled this, this, this uh, discussion, Meeting the Needs of Generations. And I think that fits nicely both for uh, our patients, you know, the, the, the older generation, as well as the next generation of providers who it, really from a skin standpoint or any perspective really uh, need to start seeing older adults as, uh, uh, as, as a little bit different than, than their younger cohorts. Um, I also put in there my uh, Twitter handle, so feel free to, to, to direct message me or, or take a screenshot of anything in this if you think it's interesting or provocative or anything along those lines. But I'm just so excited to be here with you all, so thank you for having me. And let's get started. So I'll start with uh, conflicts of interest. I do do some uh, research in uh, aging and uh, I have one grant supporting aging research uh, from Pfizer, but it's nothing that pertains to the talk today. Because today I get to talk to you about why geriatric dermatology is so important and why it's something that we should all have in the back of our mind. And I, I was just looking at the, the chat box as, as some of the answers were coming in. I don't, I don't have it anymore, so I'm, I apologize if I missed any more, but I did see at least one geriatrician in there. And uh, I, I want you to know that my feel for geriatrics is uh, very strong because I, uh, I, I, I'm very connected to the specialty. So my mentor was a geriatrician. And then uh, my wife is a geriatrician. So I'm really trying to live it. And I learned so much from our geriatric colleagues. And that's the basis of this entire talk. So I'm going to quote my favorite geriatrician here, who's my wife. And she explained to me that geriatric care is a super specialty, not a subspecialty. And I think that's such an important distinction because as we, as we see trends in medicine and as we see them sort of flow, 
we see that the biggest trend in medicine is, is super specialized care, which is a lot of the time appropriate, right? Like we're getting such advanced sciences, such advanced treatments that we need people who are so specified in their practices. But what geriatrics allows us to do, and this is from a delivery standpoint and just from a perspective standpoint, is it's really a take back approach because sometimes the best medicine is to see the entirety of the picture rather than being too focused on a singular detail. So I think that's such an important distinction and I, I give my wife, Julia Kramer, credit for it. And I love this picture. You'll keep, see this picture pop up and I want this to be emblazoned in your brains when you think about any specialized care with geriatrics, but specifically geriatric dermatology, because we're so good at bringing our microscope. We're so good at our specialized care, but in reality, we really do need to have some perspective of the bigger picture here. And I think those two pictures combined together are not mutually exclusive. You can do them at the same time. And that's why specialized geriatric care is so critical. So let's start with a case study. So this is a patient that I saw a couple years back. She's 87 and she comes in telling me it's dry skin and it won't go away. She hasn't seen a doctor in many years and this has been developing and worsening over that time period. So a pretty chronic course. These are erythematous plaques with a thin overlying scale that have progressed. She doesn't have any other symptoms to it, like joint pain or eye pain, nothing like that. But she's coming in because she's really frustrated by this. And I'm going to ask for some loose audience participation here, no pressure. But if you want to, if you could give me your answer as to what you would do, I would love that. Would you biopsy this patient? Would you give topical steroids and have the patient follow up in six months? How about topical steroids and follow up in one month? How about start narrowband light therapy, which is a treatment that we use for psoriasis and eczema? What about methotrexate, which many of you probably know as an is a, uh, is a immune modulating agent that we often use uh, for inflammatory conditions? How about an alternative systemic agent? How about a biopsy? of the lesion, like we said at the start, and then treating this patient. What about going back and discontinuing a beta blocker or a statin that the patient's on? How about calling the primary care, which is probably what many of you would want to do here, given your roles. And then uh, how about other? Is there anything else that you would want to do? I'm just going to let you sit for this for, for one minute, get some thoughts on it, but also tell you that this is a trick question. And the reason why it's a trick question is because really all of these options would be appropriate. And that's where the nuance of geriatric care comes in, is geriatrics is not just one answer for the treatment of a singular entity. We typically bucket this underserved population together with others, but the nuances of aging and comorbidity management come into play. And so we have to be able to navigate the course of the treatment of this population in a unique way. And whenever I'm struggling in clinic, I always think of this quote, and I hope that you guys can carry this quote as well. And it's from Brene Brown, who's a social, psychi so social psychologist who I absolutely love. And when it comes to this challenging underserved patient care, I love this concept of I'm here not to be right, but to get it right. And that really focuses on the processes that we go through to be able to treat the patients rather than what we were what we were taught in our educational systems that there's a right answer, right? When we took step one, step two, board scores, all these things, we were told there was a right answer. And if we were just smart enough and we studied hard enough, we would have it. But really, there's a difference to our practice methods. And it's really about working through the process to get it right for that patient who's in your office or on that telemedicine visit. And again, I'm going to get you back to this, which is seeing the details of what someone presents with, as well as the step back of the entirety of their condition. So we'll return back to that patient in a little, but I want to give you a little context for this and why I'm interested in this topic. And for me, this really goes back to my four wonderful grandparents. Uh, so I was lucky enough to have all four of them as I uh, went into medical school. Uh, I've subsequently lost three of them. I still have one of them. Um, but what they gave me is a true appreciation for aging. And that while sometimes we use aging as a bad word, we think, 
oh, you don't look that old, or oh my gosh, you look so young, you don't look your age. You know, we sort of avoid this process of aging. What my grandparents taught me is that aging should be something that's really honored. And we spend most of our life, we spend all of our life aging. And um, so it should be something that's integrated and understood and accepted and dealt with in a unique way, as opposed to something that we just sort of hope is not happening and try to include people in younger cohorts. There's nuances to this, there's peculiarities to this, yes, but it's not all bad and we can meet that moment. So with that being said, I'm gonna start the, the, the really hardcore part of the lecture, which is your take home point. It's overview and take home point, and there's only one of them just one overview and take home point. So it should be pretty simple. And that is that geriatric dermatology is indeed different than general dermatology. So one of the most common complaints I get from my specialty is that, oh, geriatric dermatology is just general dermatology. It's just everything else that we see. It's always frustrating for me to hear that because I really believe it's a unique process that, ha that, that requires a unique approach. And with that being said, I'm going to prove this to you so that it, it really is a take-home point with five observations that I've made in my career thus far. And with those five observations, I want to make sure that you have this disclaimer for me, which I wish that all providers had this disclaimer on there, but I'm going to share it with you because I think it's really important. And it's that I don't have all the answers. I'm not here to tell you the perfect way to treat a, a basal cell carcinoma or the one medication that you've been missing to treat uh, all your itchy older adults. I think that this is, again, a procedure for us to start thinking of these patients in a unique way. And so I put this disclaimer up there because as you see these observations and as I explain them to you, I hope that it engages you and gets you thinking about some of the answers that possibly you have or don't have. And you can share them with your patients, you can share them with your colleagues, or even share them with me. And I hope ultimately this helps to create an environment through the MAVEN project and partners that we can start to come up with better answers. But I don't think you can come up with answers answers until you finally admit that you don't have them. So let's get into the observations. So the first observation is that there are unique physiologic differences of aging skin that lead to unique diseases. So I, I always preface with this that I, I apologize about uh, oversimplifying the pathophysiology of aging skin because each one of these is its own career. And interestingly enough, there's a ton of research into aging skin it's just a little bit misguided because most of it is for the purpose of figuring out how to reverse it. My purpose is on the other side. I want to know, I want to better understand it and, and find ways that we can modulate it, not in a, in a reversal, uh, in reversal aspects, but understand it so that we can potentially mediate it or moderate its effects so that we can prevent disease. But those physiologic, uh, um, those physiologic changes include barrier function changes, accumulation of sun mutations, which leads to skin cancers, as well as age-related immune changes. And despite the fact that we know these pathophysiologic differences of aging skin, we still believe that aging skin is the same thing as a younger cohort, and we don't really appreciate how these may contribute to aging. And while this is getting pretty specific, I do want to introduce you into a, uh, a well-known geriatric uh, pathophysiologic principle that's making its way into dermatology, but is something that you probably see day to day. So this is this concept of inflammaging. So it's age-related increase in pro-inflammatory markers in blood and tissue that's a risk factor for multiple of the diseases that we think of that are aged in phenotype. So this is a really busy slide here, but I'm just showing you that there's this physiologic trickle down to some of our most distinguished aged diseases like uh, chronic kidney disease, cancers, dementia, osteoporosis, and the sequelae of those, which are physical disability, frailty, premature mortality. And I always like to show this because we have all of this understanding and yet the skin is not part of this despite the fact that we can look at skin and have a pretty good idea of how, how old someone is by looking at their skin or at least, at least how much sun exposure they've had. So we're trying to use this pathophysiologic knowledge to start to separate older adults from younger cohorts, even 10, 15 years younger. 
So after I've shown you the pathophysiologic differences, let's go into observation number two, which is that, hey, dermatologists are actually part of the care of older adults. So we love to include uh, older adults and younger adults just in the care of dermatology patients in general, but reality, we should acknowledge that we're major, major role players in the care of older adults. So th this is a little bit dated and this is, um, uh, this is uh, outpatient uh, data on patients over the age of 65. And long story short, if you look at all these specialists who see older adults, dermatology is number two or three after cardiovascular disease and ophthalmology. It's right there with urology as well as orthopedics. So it's one of the most common specialists who older adults see. And similar, uh, that this is a little bit older data, it's about 20 years old, but from the 80s to, to, to uh, early 2000s, you saw the largest increase in older adults seeing dermatologists as specialists as compared to all other specialties in medicine. So this is a, you know, we always talk about an aging wave, but we're certainly seeing that wave in dermatology. And I highlight this because I want to show all of you and anyone who's seeing older adults with skin disease, that dermatology is a major component of the care of aging. So let's move to observation three, which is that other specialties have given us a template for this and have established geriatric focus sections. So the reason I want to show you this is that there are people who are innovating in this underserved population, in this aging population space, to start to think of their subpopulation of aging patients in a different way. So if you look at the American Geriatric Society, you'll find that there are several specialists who actually do have this difference in their protocols for older adults. So anesthesia, orthopedics, PM&R, ophthalmology, OB-GYN, otolaryngology, emergency medicine, general surgery, and they've actually added several surgical subspecialties to this. And I, I, I put this up there slightly to shame my own specialty, but also to show you that, that we are starting to take you know, older populations in general and starting to think of them in a different way. And I want to show you further about the template that's set out there, certainly for dermatology or any specialty to, to follow in order to meet the needs of this group. So it really starts with emergency medicine. And emergency medicine is perhaps the best group at changing how they approach older adults. And they started this, I'm sure in multiple ways, but overly simplistically, they started it through research and they started it through what's called this Gemstar grant. And essentially what this was, was they started to fund people looking into the issues that older adults were having in emergency rooms. And they really hammered this home year after year to get people to do research in this area. Then I promise you, this isn't a research talk. There's a point to why I'm giving credence to emergency medicine right here. And it's that ultimately, as we bang on the pots and pans and tell people to go into it and give research funds for this, we ultimately start to see outcomes that are beneficial. So here's an AARP um, article about how we're starting to see changes in the paradigms of how we treat older adults, specifically here in emergency rooms. And once the paradigms change, the guidelines change. So here's an American College of Emergency Medicine guideline for geriatric practices in emergency rooms. And then once guidelines change, you start to see differences in patient outcomes. So here's an example of a 33% decrease in, um, in hospitalization for older adults. And again, this is just an example, but you start to see how understanding the nuances of this population ultimately comes years later to the benefit of our patients. Once we recognize those nuances, we can meet them. You start to see this also in other specialties like oncology and cardiology, which I highlight there with uh, the journals that they have specifically for older adults. So now that we know that older adults in, um, in other specialties are being cared for, let's turn our focus back to dermatology and, and think about what's happening in dermatology. So observation number four is that dermatologic diseases 
and the schematics, education, and nomenclature surrounding them often omit these geriatric differences. So now I'm really taking the hammer to my own specialty. So we really don't do a good job looking at specific diseases and how they relate to older adults. And I'm going to give you an example of this. And uh, this all started because I started to ask this question is, what do we know about aging or older adult patients with our most flagship diseases? And as we looked in the literature at this, the very clear answer was not enough. All right. So without just using this as a shaming talk, uh, we can really transition to, you know, what's the approach now? So how do you start to approach underserved patients? I know this is something that is really ingrained in, in, in everyone here and, and all the programs involved. And we started to do this by asking simple questions. What are the differences in presentation? What are the differences in pathophysiology? How about workups, treatments, outcomes? Where are the differences here? And then once we ask these simple medical questions, we can start to put feet to the pavement of getting to work to fix them. And this example I'm gonna give you is about itching. So itching is the most common symptom that older adults see a dermatologist for. And I'm sure this is something that your older patients have also explained to you, because if uh, you look at data of ambulatory visits for older adults, itching is high on almost every uh, on almost every uh, chart that you'll look at for primary care, dermatologists, neurologists, you name it. Itching is very common. And this is one of the flagship papers published about 10 years ago where they looked at the incidence and prevalence of itching uh, across genders and ethnicities. And it's, it's a huge phenomenon. I mean, we are seeing itching all over the place. It starts at about 65, which for the record is not old by any means, but it's just the, the time that we start to see an uptick across populations for the incidence and prevalence of itch. All right, so what does that mean? Well, now we're asking the questions. Why is itch so prevalent in older adults? And as you look into dermatologic textbooks, what you'll find is a chart that looks exactly like this. And it's overly simplistic. So they'll look at itch in older adults and there'll be dermatologic causes of itch. That's over there on the left side, which is things that you probably have seen before, the eczemas, the psoriasis, the dry skin, the things that we can see with our eyes. And then the other side of the equation is something that as a first year resident in dermatology, you're really good at doing, which is if there's no rash for an itchy patient, you have about six lab tests that you order and you can see them there at the bottom. That's not the purpose of this slide. What the purpose of this slide is, is to show you this circle right here. So I became obsessed with these charts because they were overly simplistic and they showed dermatologic causes, they showed non-dermatologic causes, but they didn't show what most people were coming in for. And finally, I found a chart that showed it. And it was this, it was that most patients come in with a non-specific or non-recognizable dermatologic cause. And while this chart doesn't quite explain what that population is, it was the first time I started to see that there were probably more answers to these questions that we were asking. Remember back to those overly simplistic questions that we were asking about why we don't have great uh, 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 um, answers for this population. So with that, we started to ask more questions. Okay, so what's going on with older adults that would potentially give them this nonspecific uh, uh, dermatologic skin change, but not with any underlying uh, 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 disease that we would find in our lab values and without a really distinguished, clear dermatologic presentation? Well, in that pathophysiology, pathophysiology you can think back to what we were talking about with the age-related differences. So we know that there are changes in the immune system as we age. There's thymic involution. There's typically a gradual tendency to the Th2 profile of our immune system, which if you all remember, that's the atopic side of our immune system, which exaggerates interleukins like IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. And then often you can see a subtle elevation in IgE. You often also see a subtle elevation in non-IgE-mediated mediated atopic disease. So we're starting to put together a profile of this. 
And as we start to see the details of the pathophysiology, we can start to peel back some of the misunderstandings. And one of the misunderstandings that I want to highlight today is the concept of immune senescence. This came up as we were looking at this question of why pathophysiology of itching patients are different. When I was in medical school, I was taught this concept of immunosenescence and how it is a decrease in the immune system as we age. But what we're actually finding, if you look at those facts there, it's not a decrease in the immune system, it's a change or a dysregulation of the immune system. And so that simple change in, in our understanding of this concept that's pervasive, now we start to get credence to where we may, why we may be seeing these older itchy patients. As we start to get credence of that, we start to see that there's a mess of the literature and the nomenclature of these patients is very, very chaotic. So there's different names for these non-dermatologic specific itchy patients without, un without other underlying causes. So some call them atopic dermatitis spectrum disorder. Some call them late onset atopic dermatitis eczema of the elderly, eruption of immune senescence, subacute parigo, paritis of the elderly, Grover's disease, paritis of unknown origin, senile paritis, just general paritis. All of these get blurred together and ultimately we have this chaotic mess of what we're calling it. And because we don't know what we're calling it, we ultimately fail to be able to study it. So we really need to be able to clear up the nomenclature and that only comes through additional questions. Because we've been able to ask these questions, we've ultimately given this new entity a name and that's what you're seeing up at the top there, which is called the immunologic eruption of aging. Now, I don't expect all of you to go to clinic tomorrow, see an itchy patient and be able to say, oh, this is an immunologic eruption of aging. No one can do that. But I'm just showing you how in older adults, we have to start to piece together or at least uncover some of the chaotic stuff that we have that's inhibiting us from understanding this underserved population. So then we keep asking questions. We start to create a framework for this concept of the immunologic eruption of aging, likely related to that dysregulation. So we look into the history. What does it sound like when we ask about the history? How about the physical exam? Do they look the exact same? Do they have differences? What are the shared elements of it? And then what are the workup elements that we may consider using in this patient population? And these are some of the things that we consider here, but really I'm just stressing how we're starting to think of this patient population a little differently from a workup standpoint and also from a treatment standpoint. So we've started to work on how we can teach dermatologists and other providers how we can approach this patient population in a really, really scientific way. And that includes empiric treatments or consideration of empiric treatments, the use of topical options with regular follow-up, the consideration of phototherapy or even immune suppression, and then neuropathic agents, which play a big role in the immune system uh, of older adults as well. And I'm happy to get into some of the science there as well. But these are some of the things that we start to use in this populations. And these are some of the questions that we keep asking to really, really hit home. How, uh, what are we missing in this underserved population? And how can we use our tools to start to meet where those holes need to be plugged? So that was the example of, uh, of itching. There are so many other diseases for us to explore. So one of the ones that you've probably heard of within dermatology, one of our flagship diseases is pyoderma gangrenosum, which is often a, uh, a non-healing ulceration. And the interesting thing for those who took step one or step two, uh, we often learned that pyoderma gangrenosum was in a, a young woman who had inflammatory bowel disease. And the interesting thing is this is a study we did about three or four years ago, where we found that actually the majority of patients with pyoderma gangrenosum from a cohort of patients that still to this day is the largest studied cohort of pyoderma gangrenosum patients were over the age of 65. And that's not surprising, but it also means that we have a lot of work to do to start to figure out what are some of the nuances in this population. And one that we highlighted from this study is that when a patient does have uh, 
does have pyodermic gangrenosum and they're over the age of 65, they're more likely to be associated with blood or hematologic malignancies rather than the schematic of the younger cohort, which is <clears throat> where they're typically more associated with inflammatory bowel disease. So now you're starting to see how our questions are providing some differences and how we as providers can think of these patients. And I'm throwing this in there really quickly because I think there's a lot of reasons as to why we're not asking these questions. I already gave the example of the messy nomenclature, the names that we use. But another one is that we have systems that are actually limiting our knowledge here. So we exclude older adults from uh, clinical trials, and that limits our ability to be able to study these patients. And I like to highlight this at the end of thinking about different diseases, because if we don't start to look at patients with the disease, these diseases in a critical way in our clinical trials, then we're never going to understand them more. So there's a lot at stake. There's a lot. There's a lot of blame to throw around here, but it's important that we also take a look beyond just what we know and what we're seeing in our specialty and in the systems that influence our specialty, like clinical trials. And this is not just for dermatology. This is across the board. And these are some other diseases that you may see geriatric cohorts in, SJS and TEN, which is Steven Johnson syndrome, which is a dermatologic emergency. There's a huge cohort of older adults who present with this. Of course, scabies, psoriasis, cutaneous malignancies uh, have, have large geriatric cohorts. And then vesiculobullous diseases like bullous pemphigoid uh, are very common in this population and require us to start asking those same questions to be able to meet their needs. So now that I've convinced you that our, uh, our education and nomenclature systems often neglect dermatologists, I'm going to get to my most controversial part, which is that our care of older adults is controversial. And this was first highlighted in a, uh, in a, uh, 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 I'm sure it was highlighted before this, I shouldn't say first, but the, uh, the first really public time was in a, a New York Times article where they were looking at how older adults were treated by dermatologists and how the skin can and how skin cancers were managed in this population. And this was a real, uh, 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 flagship moment for our, uh, for our specialty, because we really had to evaluate if we wanted to start to think of this patient population in a unique way. And I think this was a wonderful catalyst, despite the consternation that it produced because we were being criticized. We really started to study how we were approaching this patient population. So there's a group of researchers that started to ask, should we be doing skin cancer removals and skin cancer surgeries on older adult patients? And as we started to ask these questions, you started to see a really healthy ecosystem begin to develop. So as we asked those questions, you started to see research on the other side where the surgeons were explaining why they would do research or why they would do surgery on this, on, on this population. And while I'm showing you research that comes in conflict with one another, I think that's such an important ecosystem for underserved patients, is you want an ecosystem, a research ecosystem, a specialty ecosystem, where people are debating things that have no right answer. There's never a right answer that's going to blanket everyone of should you do surgery or shouldn't you do surgery. It's nuanced. So we need to be doing research on all angles to be able to look at that. And this is what a healthy system looks like when you're starting to evaluate uh, the best practices in older adults. And we are just getting there in dermatology and it's very exciting to start to see. But I like to highlight that because it was only through the controversies that were brought up publicly that we started to see the growth of this really healthy research and clinical ecosystem. <clears throat> so now that you've seen the five, uh, the five observations, I go back to the one take home message is geriatric dermatology different than general dermatology? And I hope now you see that that is indeed a different uh, approach and practice. And I'm sure it's something that you see in your, own, uh, in your own patient population, but I hope you can carry that with you and continue to ask these questions about some of the diseases you're seeing in the, in the patients that you're seeing. 
So what's the future of geriatric dermatology? And the future is wide open, wide open. It's a really, really small sub, 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 sub specialty. So this is my way of engaging you. If you want to run in this open area, please do, because there's plenty of questions to ask and curiosities to fulfill. And really what we need to do is collaborate with research, clinical practice, and education. You know, the three big prongs of any developing group in medicine. And I love this because I asked, uh, I asked geriatricians what dermatologists uh, could help them with. And ultimately, I got some great answers and I wanted to, I wanted to share those with you. So they said, my, my patient has uh, dozens of skin issues. I don't know where to start. And this hits on the concept of there's a lot going on in older adults. How do we, how do we meet the needs of older adults in a busy clinic? Another one was, why are all my patients itchy? I think now you have all the answers to that, of course, right? Education. I feel I'm undereducated about the skin. Who is Mohs and why is it different than surgery? So this is a special type of surgery we do in dermatology. That's a skin cancer removal surgery. That's so critical for us to be able to dive into and explain to the providers who may be seeing patients who are post-surgical. Can we please have patients stop exercising after procedures? That's one of the biggest pet peeves that geriatricians have shared with me is that dermatologists, again, don't have that step back approach. And they're seeing that after surgeries, we often tell patients to take it easy for the next week or two, but we're learning from them that that may have more detrimental effects than it is beneficial. So we have to start changing our practices. And then help keep my patient out of the hospital. And as you know, that is our ultimate goal. And I'm highlighting these because there's a lot of different perspectives here. And we really do need to collaborate um, in order to get this where we want it to be to meet this underserved patient population. And so what we're doing on the national level is we're partnering with the geriatric dermato or the, geri the American Geriatric Society to create a partnership between our two national organizations. We've also started an expert resource group and we had our initial meeting three years ago where we met and had specialists talk about future directions for this patient population in dermatology and across geriatrics. And then within each of the walks, we're working to improve patient care and understand the patient care needs. So we're trying to create geriatric dermatology clinics we're trying to create, create shared decision-making educational models for all providers when dealing with some skin issues. And we're trying to have advanced assessments so that we can understand better where the risks are for older adults when we're doing surgery or when we're starting dangerous systemic medications that may carry certain additional risks for older adults. And then for research, we're going to go back to some of the most keen concepts that we need to be focused on, which are collaborations and understanding unique systems and their aging uh, phenotypes and how those phenotypes may relate together with our older patients. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not just about trying to prevent aging, it's, it's, it's trying to understand it so that we can modulate it in the way that we want. And that also happens with, as I mentioned, uh, the example of emergency medicine, that happens with collaboration and with uh, uh, partnering outside of our specialty to understand uh, where these things are coming from. And then lastly, for future research is we really need to be inclusive in our clinical trials, uh, 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 hopefully for additional medication development. And then lastly, and this is part of the mission that I, I love that we're practicing today is, is education. You know, it's, it's, such an important, it's such an important thing for us to, to, to collaborate with people like you all who are, uh, who, are, who are seeing patients who have their unique skin disease, and we need to be learning from you and hopefully teaching you as well, and essentially meeting the needs of all providers who are seeing this older cohort of patients. And hopefully we can develop that into curricula, and then uh, shared decision-making educational models as well. <clears throat> so let's return back to that uh, trick case that I showed you earlier. So now you have a good idea that there's no perfect answer for this patient population. 
And it really is about understanding the needs of that patient in the context of what's going on broadly, that their aging systems, be it immune or otherwise, are different. And while we have that specific lens, we also need to take a step back and see this patient uh, in, in, in the broadest sense. We need to see their life, their quality. We need to see the things that, 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 that make them them. And that's what will help us create the right treatment plan. So this is actually a patient with psoriasis and any of these would be completely acceptable in this patient. She ended up being someone who did not want to be on an internal medication. So we treated her with topicals. And for her, that was the easiest way to avoid some of the itching burden that she had. And she wasn't as bothered by the appearance of the rash. So we were able to meet her there and not have to treat her with some major medication that could potentially carry some other stressors. I always, with this case though, like to highlight that if she had wanted to do one of those other medications, a more involved or potentially more dangerous medication, we need studies that show what are the specific risks in older adults to be able to really educate myself and her about those risks. And that's why I like to bring this, this case back is that there's still work to be done, but as long as we keep our specialist lens as well as our holistic perspective, I think we can meet the moment uh, of this huge wave of older adults who are coming down the pipeline and going to be seeing us all in our various clinics for a number of things, which will inevitably be some skin disease as well. So my last time with the take-home point, and that is, please remember that geriatric dermatology is different than general dermatology. And with that, I'd like to thank you. And I'd love to uh, thank the Maven Project for having me here, as well as uh, 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 all the other programs who are supporting the initiatives that you all are a part of. I think it's so important. And um, I, I'm just uh, so happy that I was able to be a part of this. And I'm totally open to communicating further about any ideas or questions that you have moving forward. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Butler. That was wonderful. Um, just a reminder, if you have any questions, you can uh, type them into our Q&A box, the chat box, or use the raise hand feature, and I will unmute you so you can speak directly with Dr. Butler. So we'll just pause for a moment and wait for those questions to come in. All right, um, don't see anything. So I guess everybody is now is now a uh, an expert. So thank you, Dr. Butler, that was great. Um, uh, just a reminder that you will receive in about less than two weeks, we usually like to say a week, but we'll give ourselves two weeks just to be safe, an email. This will actually come from MailChimp, so please pay attention, and it will have the slide deck and the recording. Um, we do have a question. Do you have any guidelines for how to counsel geriatric patients about ba ba basal cell ceremony intervention? Yeah, of course. Now, Michelle, this is a great question. I'm so glad you asked it, and I I'm sorry that I didn't get into some of the details of these. Um, you know, uh, the the answer here, as 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 you probably expect me to say, is is really nuanced. You know, there's a ton of ways to approach basal cells. So you can treat them topically. You can treat them with scraping procedures. You can treat them with large surgical procedures. Um, and I try to make sure that I explain that to the patient all the time. And so before I come in with a heavy hand and recommend one single treatment, I try to explain all the different options so that the patient, what I described, knows the menu and that the patient and I or my team can communicate what the benefits and downfalls of each option may be. Because for me, it's very rare that there's one single uh, there's one single treatment option that fits for everyone. And that may change, you know, year to year, month to month, depending on what's going on, depending on what other things are happening. Basal cells are in this sort of odd ground where they're a cancer, but 
they're very rarely metastatic. And so they can be managed in many different ways. And so what I tell patients uh, and, and when I teach students and residents and other colleagues, I always tell them, share the decision with the patient. Always talk with them about the options, even if you think one is better than the others, because there might be something going on in their life that's more important right now, or it may be the most important thing and they may want to go full throttle. Um, and you didn't really expect that that would be the case, but I always share that decision with them. I'm happy to get into specifics too, if that, if that wasn't satisfying. So we have a few more questions. Um, next one is, can you provide any pearls for evaluating hyperpigmentation in the elderly? Yeah, I mean, whew, that's a that's a good question. Um, the there's a lot of different things that can cause hyperpigmentation in older adults. Um, the first one I would say is is uh, the first and easiest distinction to make is looking at where the hyperpigmentation is on the skin. The most common locations for hyperpigmentation are in sun related areas. And that's typically the first distinction I would make if I were you is, is this something that's potentially sun related or is this something potentially that's not sun related? If it's sun related, you know, you're going to use your first initial steps as sun protection and really aggressive sun protection can be really important. If it's not in sun related areas, then you may want to step back and think of some of the other pigmenting processes that could be going on that are causing it. So something like an autoimmune disease that may be triggering it. And you can also look at the nature of the pigmentation and the location of the pigmentation. Like, is it on the palms? Is it somewhere else on the body that, uh, that, that the sun doesn't, doesn't hit? Different types of pigmentation disorders can hit different types of the body. So my first uh, my first pearl to that would be look at sun versus non-sun and then use that to create your differential. Wonderful. Um, okay. Which cancers usually need most surgery? Is it only melanomas? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's actually, uh, we actually rarely do uh, Mohs surgery on melanomas. There is something called slow Mohs or a, a, a delayed Mohs procedure where we do uh, 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 Mohs surgery on melanomas. But for the most part, Mohs surgery is exclusively, is exclusively for squamous cell carcinomas and basal cell carcinomas. And it's typically uh, reserved for higher risk squamous and basal cell carcinomas. And by higher risk, that usually means that it's on the face or in other high risk areas like the tops of the hands or the genitals. The other high risk lesion that you can consider within those are larger basal cells and squamous cells. So anything over two centimeters is generally recommended to be qualified for Mohs. But when something qualifies for Mohs, that doesn't necessarily mean that it requires Mohs. It just means that it may be an availability. So it depends on a number of different things. And that also may be you know, the availability of Mohs in your, you know, in your, in, in, close to your practice. So typically we do slow Mohs for melanoma, which is a delayed Mohs procedure, but for the most part, Mo, uh, melanomas are, are treated with wide local excisions and it's usually higher risk basal cells and squamous cells that can get Mohs procedures. Uh, next question. How do you navigate patient with dementia and deciding to move forward with a workup and treatment? Yeah, really, really challenging. And I, I have uh, uh, two pearls to this. And uh, I, first, I'd like to thank the geriatricians and internists and providers who see patients with dementia on here because they're really key in uh, providing help to any specialist, but particularly us as dermatologists when managing these patients. So I'll almost always talk with family members about it. Of course, it's, you know, it's required by law, but talking with family about it and what their hopes would be. The other part of this is understanding how bothered the patient is by whatever it is that they're concerned about. So, um, you know, two of the most common things that we see in patients with uh, cognitive impairment are itching, or any type of rash that's itching uh, and, uh, and, and a skin cancer. And sometimes if those things aren't bothering the patient or their caregiver, 
then we can let them go. That's totally fine. But if these are starting to become problematic for the patient, like say they're itching at night and they're not sleeping or they're picking at the area and it's bleeding through their clothes or it's starting to get infected and it's smelling, these are things to me that become our new metric for deciding when and how to treat. So I use those as quality of life metrics uh, all the time in patients with dementia to make sure that we're still highlighting where their life is and make sure that we're prioritizing them, even if they're unable to communicate their direct needs at that moment. So that's my long-winded way of saying engage uh, primary care geriatricians, engage family members, and see how uh, their symptoms or their disease is impairing their quality of life. So one great example of this is I had a patient who smelled really bad for a long time. Um, that was what I was told uh, they were coming in for from one of their care facilities. And when they came in to see me, they had a, a, a necrotic infected basal cell on their back that was about three or four uh, uh, centimeters. And the smell uh, had sort of just been attributed to the patient. And ultimately it was causing people to not want to visit the patient and was leading to a, a, additional loneliness for the patient. And once we got that treated, it was, uh, it was like a revelation. You know, he, he, the patient didn't necessarily have that, that odor anymore. And uh, it was, it was permissive for a lot of other parts of their life. Now that sounds like a tragic story and probably overly simplistic, but it's one of the ways that you can think of that, you know, your treatment plan in this circumstance needs to consider how that condition is affecting other parts of their life. Great. Well, I don't see any more questions, but um, if you do have questions, um, I guess, please feel free to email me and I will uh, share them with Dr. Butler and get you an answer back. Um, but otherwise, Dr. Butler, thank you so much for presenting today. This is really wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you uh, to everyone from the Maven Project for, for all that you're doing. I'm, I'm, I'm so impressed and, and uh, so, so tickled to be a, a small part of it. Well, thank you. All right.